Hey everyone, this is Ben Norton, and you are watching or listening to the Multipolarista podcast. And I am always privileged to be joined by one of my favorite guests, Michael Hudson, one of the greatest economists living today. We're going to be talking about the inflation crisis. This is a crisis around the world, but especially in the United States, inflation has been at over 8%, and it's caused a lot of political problems. It's very likely going to cause the defeat, well, among other factors, the defeat of the Democrats in the midterm elections in November. And we've seen that the response of the U.S. government and top ec economists in the United States is basically to blame inflation on wages, on low levels of unemployment, and on working people. We've seen that the chair of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, has said that inflation is being caused by wages supposedly being too high. We've also seen that the top economist and uh, former Clinton administration official Larry Summers has claimed that the solution to inflation is increasing unemployment, potentially up to 10%. So today I'm joined by economist Michael Hudson, who's been calling out this kind of neoliberal snake oil economics for many years. And Professor Hudson has an article he just published that we're going to talk about today. You can find this at his website, which is michael-hudson.com. It's titled, The Fed's Austerity Program to Reduce Wages. And I'm, I'm going to let Professor Hudson summarize the main points of his article. But Professor Hudson, as always, it's a pleasure having you. Can you respond to the decision by the Federal Reserve to increase interest rates to buy 0.75 percent doesn't sound like a lot it's less than one percent but it was the largest rate hike since 1994 and now we've already seen reports that there's going to be a depression the fed chair is blaming it on wages can, can you just respond to the position of the fed and the inflation crisis in the u.s right now for the fed the only uh, two things that it can do is number one raise the uh, discount rate uh, the interest rate uh, and number two, spend $9 trillion buying stocks and bonds and real estate mortgages to uh, increase uh, real estate prices and to increase the amount of wealth that the wealthiest 10% uh, of the population has. Uh, to the wealthiest 10%, especially the 1%, uh, it's not only uh, inflation, uh, it's not only uh, inflation that's a problem of wages, Every problem that America has is a problem of the working class earning too much money. And if you're an employer, uh, that's the problem. You want, to, uh, you want to increase your profits. And if you look at the short term, your profits go up the more that you can squeeze uh, labor down. And the way to uh, increase, uh, uh, to squeeze labor down is to uh, increase what uh, Marx called the reserve army of the unemployed. Uh, you need unemployment in order to uh, prevent labor from getting uh, most of the value of what it produces so that the employers can get uh, the value and pay that employer to the banks and the financial managers that have taken over corporate industry in the United States. Um, you mentioned uh, that uh, while the Fed calls the inflation and blames it on uh, labor, uh, that's not uh, President Biden's view. Biden keeps calling it the Putin inflation. And of course, uh, what he really means uh, is uh, that uh, the sanctions that America has uh, placed on uh, Russia have uh, created a uh, shortage of oil, gas, energy, and food uh, exports. So it's really, we're, we're in the Biden inflation. And the Biden inflation that America is experiencing uh, is uh, the result, basically, of America's military policy, its foreign policy, and above all, the Democratic Party's support of the oil industry, which is the most uh, powerful uh, sector uh, in the United States, uh, and which is guiding, guiding most of the sanctions against Russia, uh, and uh, the national security state that uh, bases America's power on its ability to export uh, oil or control the oil trade and uh, of all the countries and 
to export agricultural products. So if you look at uh, what we're in the middle of right now, isn't simply a domestic issue of uh, uh, wage earners uh, wanting uh, uh, higher salaries, uh, which they're not uh, particularly getting. Uh, certainly the minimum wage has not been increased, but you have to put this in the context of the whole Cold War uh, that's going on. Uh, the whole uh, U.S. and NATO confrontation of Russia has been uh, a godsend, as you and I have spoken before, for the oil industry and the farm exporters. And this is uh, the result is that the U.S. dollar uh, is rising uh, against uh, the euro, against sterling, and against global south currencies. Well, in principle, a rising dollar should make the price of imports low. Uh, so something else is at work. And uh, what's at work, of course, is the fact that uh, uh, the uh, oil industry is a monopoly, that most of the prices that have been going up are basically uh, the result of a monopolization. In the case of food, uh, by the uh, marketing firms like Cargill uh, and uh, Archer McDaniels uh, that buy most of the crops from the farmers. The irony is that while food prices uh, are next to oil prices are the major factor that's soaring, fa uh, farmers are getting less and less uh, for their crops. And yet farmers' costs are going up, up for fertilizer, up for energy, up for other inputs, so that you're having enormous profits uh, on the uh, uh, Archer McDaniels and the, the food, uh, food uh, monopolists uh, of the distributors and uh, enorm uh, enormous gains for the uh, oil industry and also, of course, for the military industrial complex. So uh, if you look at what's happening in, in the overall uh, world economic system, uh, you can see that this inflation is being uh, engineered and the beneficiaries of this inflation certainly have not been uh, the wage earners by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, the crisis uh, that the uh, uh, Biden policy has created is being blamed on the wage earners instead of on uh, the Biden administration's foreign policy uh, and uh, the uh, uh, basically the uh, U.S.-NATO uh, war with, to isolate Russia, China, India, Iran, and uh, uh, the uh, Eurasia generally. Yeah, Pro Professor Hudson, I want to talk about the the increase in interest rates by the Fed. This, there's been a lot of attention to this, although, again, it's 0.75%, which is not that big, but it's, of course, going to have an outsized impact on the economy. In your article, again, this is your column at michael-hudson.com, the Fed's austerity program to reduce wages. You, you talk about the Fed's junk economics, junk economics, junk economics, and you note that uh, banks, so you say that the idea behind raising interest rates by 0.75% is that raising interest rates will cure inflation by deterring borrowing to spend on the basic needs that make up the consumer price index. But you point out banks do not finance much consumption except for credit card debt, which is now less than student loans and automobile loans. Banks lend almost entirely to buy real estate, stocks and bonds, not goods and services. So you argue that one of the effects of this is that it's actually going to roll back home ownership in the United States. You know that the, the rate of home ownership has been falling since 2008. So can you expand on those arguments? What will be the impact of the increase of interest, uh, the, uh, the interest um, rates by the Fed? Well, in order to get an economics degree, which is needed to work uh, at the Fed or the uh, Council of Economic Advisors, you have to take economics courses in the university. And uh, all of the textbooks say that uh, just what uh, you quoted me uh, is, is saying, they say, that the pretense is that banks actually play a productive role in society by uh, providing the money for uh, factories to uh, build uh, uh, buy machinery and build a uh, plant and uh, do research and development and to hire, hire labor, uh, and that somehow the money that banks uh, create is all lent out uh, for industrial uh, economy, uh, and that uh, that will enable companies to uh, make more money 
uh, that they'll uh, spend on labor. And of course, as they spend more money on labor, that supports the bid uh, uh, prices up as the reserve army of the unemployed is depleted. But uh, that's all a fiction. Uh, the textbooks don't want to say that banks don't play a productive role like that at all. And the corporations don't do what the textbooks say. Uh, as you just pointed, if you look at the Federal Reserve uh, uh, balance sheet uh, and, and statistics that it publishes uh, every month, uh, you'll see that 80% of bank loans in the United States are mortgage loans to uh, for commercial real estate and mostly for home real estate. And uh, uh, of course, the uh, home mortgage loans have been nothing like uh, under under 1% uh, for the last uh, uh, 14 years uh, since 2008. Uh, only uh, the banks and the large uh, borrowers, the financial sector, have been able to borrow at these low rates. Homeowners all along have had to pay uh, very high rates, uh, uh, just under 4%, and now it's going uh, above 4%, heading to 5%. Well, here's the situation that the Federal Reserve has created. Suppose that uh, you're a family right now uh, going out to uh, buy a home, and uh, you, you find out that in uh, order to borrow the money to buy the home, because nobody, uh, if the average home in America costs uh, a six or seven hundred thousand uh, dollars, very uh, people haven't saved that much. The only way you can buy a home is to take out a mortgage. Well, uh, you, uh, you have a choice. You can either rent. Uh, a home, or you can borrow the money to buy a home. And traditionally, for uh, a century, the uh, carrying charge for uh, uh, financing a home with a mortgage has been about the equivalent of paying a rent. The advantage is, of course, that you get to own the home when it's over. Well, now let's look at what's happening right now. All of a sudden, uh, the carrying charge of mortgages have gone way, way up. The banks are making an enormous gap. They can borrow at uh, just around 1%, and they lend out at 4.5%. Uh, they get a windfall gain of the markup they have in mortgages, lending to uh, prospective homeowners. And, of course, the homeowners don't have enough money to, uh, uh, to, to, earn, to be able to pay uh, the higher interest charge on uh, the mortgages that they take out. So uh, they uh, are not able to... Bid as, uh, buy as expensive a home as they want before, but they're not. They've been a declining part of the po population. Uh, at, at the time Obama took office, uh, about 68 percent, over 68 percent of Americans owned their own home. Uh, Obama started the great wave of eviction of 10 million Americans uh, who lived in homes, uh, uh, essentially to uh, throw them out, out of their homes, especially the victims of the junk mortgages, especially, especially the lower income uh, and racial minorities who were uh, redlined and had to uh, become the main victims of the uh, mortgages. America's home ownership rate is now under 61%. What's happened? You've had huge uh, 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 private capital firms come into the market thinking, wait a minute, we can uh, now buy these properties and rent them out. And we can buy them for all cash. Uh, unlike homeowners, we're multi-billionaires. We, uh, Blackstone, BlackRock, uh, you have uh, these uh, multi-billion dollar uh, funds. And uh, they say, well, we can make, uh, we can't make much money uh, buying bonds or buying stocks that yield uh, what they do today now that the Federal Reserve has uh, ground down uh, interest rates. Uh, what we can do is uh, make money as landlords. And so they've shifted, they've reversed the whole shift from away from uh, the 19th century landlordism uh, to uh, a rental to economy and financialization and uh, the uh, wealthy classes making money uh, on finance to go back to making money as landlords. And so they are buying up uh, these homes that American homeowners can't afford uh, to buy. Because uh, if when you raise the mortgage rate, that doesn't affect a billionaire at all because the billionaire uh, firm doesn't uh, have to borrow money to buy the home. They have the billion dollars of their own money, of pension fund money, of uh, speculative money, of uh, uh, the money of the 1% and the 10% uh, to spend. So uh, what you're having by the 
uh, increasing the interest rates is squeezing homeowners out of the market and turning the American economy into uh, a landlord-ridden rental economy instead of a homeowner's economy. That That's uh, the effect, and it's a windfall for the private capital firms that are now uh, seeing that uh, making money as landlords the old-fashioned way, it worked for 800 years under feudalism. Uh, it's it's coming back in style. Yeah, Professor Hudson, you, you point out in this article at your website that more than 50% of the value of U.S. real estate already is held by mortgage bankers. And of course, that percentage is increasing and increasing. Now, you, Professor Hudson, have argued a point that I haven't seen many other people make, although it's an obvious correct point, which is that there has actually been a lot of inflation in the United States in the past several years, but that inflation was in the fire sector, finance, insurance, and real estate. We see that with the constant increase in real estate prices that go up every single year, rent goes up every single year. The difference now is that there's also a significant increase in the consumer price index. And there was a, an interesting study published by the Economic Policy Institute, which is, you know, a, a center left think tank uh, affiliated with the labor movement. You know, they're not radicals, they're progressives. And they did a, a very good study and they found this was published this April, they found that corporate profits are responsible for around 54% of the increase of prices in the non-financial corporate sector, as opposed to unit labor costs only being responsible for around 8% increase. So they showed scientifically that over half of the increase in, of prices in the non-financial corporate sector, that is in the consumer price index, over half of that inflation is because of corporate corporate profits. Of course, that's not the way it's discussed in mainstream media. That's not the way the Fed is discussing it all. We see Larry Summers saying that we need to increase inflation. Larry Summers, of course, was the Treasury Secretary for Bill Clinton. He's saying that, um, excuse me, he said we have to be, the U.S. has to increase unemployment. The solution to inflation is increasing unemployment, even though these studies show that over half of inflation in, in the consumer price index is because of corporate, corporate profits. Uh, I'm wondering if, if you can comment on why so many economists, including people as revered as Larry Summers, refuse to acknowledge that reality. Uh, most economists need to get employment. And uh, they, in order to be employed, you have to uh, give a picture of the economy that reflects how well your employer help society uh, at large. Uh, you're not allowed to say that your employer is acting in ways that are purely predatory. You're not allowed to say that the employer does not earn an income. Uh, you talk about corporate profits and uh, the classical economists, if you were a free market economist like Adam Smith or uh, David Ricardo or John Stuart Mill, these are economic, these are monopoly rents. So what you uh, call corporate profits are, are way above normal uh, corporate uh, rates of return, uh, no, normal profits. They're economic rents from monopoly. And that's because uh, about uh, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, the United States stopped uh, 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 impo uh, imposing its uh, anti-monopoly laws. Uh, it's uh, essentially let uh, monopolies uh, concentrate markets, concentrate power, and charge uh, wh whatever they want. And so once you've dismantled the whole legal framework that was put in place from the 1890s, from the Sherman Antitrust Act, uh, down through the early 20th century, the New Deal, once you've dismantled all of the state control, uh, saying uh, uh, essentially uh, what Larry Summers says is, we're for a free market. A free market is one in which uh, companies can charge whatever they want to charge for things. A free market is one without government regulation. A free market is one without government. Uh, a free market is a weak enough government so that it cannot protect uh, wage earners. Uh, it cannot protect voters. A democracy is a country where the uh, bulk of the population, the wage earners, have no ability to affect 
uh, economic policy in their own interest. Uh, a free market is one where instead of the government being the planner, Wall Street is the planner on behalf of the large industries that are uh, basically being financialized. Uh, and uh, so you've had a transformation of the concept of uh, what a free market is, a dismantling of government regulation, a dismantling of anti-monopoly uh, regulation, and uh, uh, essentially, the class war is back in business. That's what uh, the Biden administration is all about. And quite frankly, it's what the Democratic Party is all about, even more than the Republican Party. The Republican Party can, can advocate pro, uh, uh, pro business policies and pro financial policies, but the Democratic Party is in charge of dismantling the legacy of, pro uh, of uh, protection of the economy that uh, had been put in place uh, for a century. Yeah. And here is the article in this is uh, an article in Forbes that was originally based on an article in Bloomberg. Larry Summers, uh, five years at six percent unemployment or one year at 10 percent. That's what Larry Summers says we'll need to defeat inflation. That's how simple it is. You know, just de increase unemployment and and then you know inflation will magically go away. Now, I also wanted to get your response, Professor Hudson, to these comments that you highlighted in a panel that was organized by the International Manifesto Group, a great organization. People can find their, their channel here at YouTube. And they held a, uh, a hearing, a um, conference on inflation. And you were one of several speakers. And you highlighted these comments that were made by the Fed chair, Jerome Powell. And this is according to the official transcript from the Wall Street Journal. So this is not from some lefty socialist website. Here's the official transcript of a May 4th press conference given by the Fed chief, Jerome Powell. In this press conference, he said, discussing inflation, he said, I, uh, he said in order to get inflation down, um, he's talking about things that, that, that can be done um, that would give us a chance to have lower to get inflation to get wages down and then get inflation down without having to slow the economy and have a recession and have unemployment rise materially. So this is another proposal. Larry Summers says 6% unemployment for five years or 10% unemployment for one year. The Fed chair, Jerome Powell says the solution is to get wages down. I'm wondering if you can respond to that as well. Well, uh, the important thing to realize is that President Biden reappointed Jerome Powell. Uh, President Biden is a Republican. The Democratic Party is basically the right wing of the Republican Party, the uh, pro-financial, the pro-Wall Street wing of the Republican Party. Why on earth would, if the Democrats were different from the Republicans, why would, uh, uh, would Biden reappoint a Republican anti-labor uh, head of the Federal Reserve instead of uh, uh, someone that uh, uh, would actually try to spur employment. Imagine here's a party uh, that uh, is trying to be elected on a program of elect us and we will create a depression and we will lower wages. That is the Democratic Party slogan. And it's a winning slogan. It, because elections are won by campaign contributions. The slogan is, we will lower wages by bringing a depression, is a tsunami of uh, contributions to the Democratic Party by uh, Wall Street, by the monopolists, by all the beneficiaries uh, of this uh, policy. So that's why the Supreme Court uh, ruling uh, against abortions the other day is uh, a gift to the Democrats because it distracts attention from uh, uh, what they their identity politics of uh, breaking America into all sorts of uh, identities, every identity you can think of, except being a wage earner. Uh, what, uh, the wage earners are called deplorables, uh, basically. And uh, that's how the uh, donor class uh, thinks of them, uh, is sort of uh, unfortunate overhead. You need to employ them, but it really, uh, you, it's unfortunate that they uh, uh, like to live as well as they do because uh, the better they live, the less uh, money that you uh, end up with. Uh, so uh, I think that this, uh, this issue of the inflation and what really causes it really should be what elections are all about. 
this should be the economic core of uh, this uh, November's election campaign and the 2024 election campaign. And uh, the, uh, the, the Democrats are leading uh, the fight to lower wages. Uh, and uh, you, you remember that uh, when uh, President Obama was elected, he promised to increase uh, the minimum wage. As soon as he got in, he said, the one thing we cannot do is raise the minimum wage. And uh, he'd also promised to back card check. He said, the one thing we must not do is increase labor unionization uh, with card check, because if you unionize labor, they're going to ask for uh, better wages and better working conditions. So you have the Democratic Party uh, taking about as hard a right-wing position, uh, a sort of Chicago school monetarism, saying uh, the solution to uh, uh, any, any problem at all is just uh, lower wages and somehow you'll be more competitive, where uh, as American economy is already rendered uncompetitive, not because uh, wages are so high, but because, the, uh, as uh, you mentioned before, the fire sector, the finance, insurance, and uh, uh, real estate sector is so high. Rents uh, and home ownership, having a home uh, is uh, too expensive to be competitive with a foreign, uh, foreign labor. Uh, having to pay 18% of GDP on medical uh, care, privatized medical care, is uh, prices American labor out of the market. Uh, the, all of the debt service that America has paid uh, is pricing America out of uh, uh, the market. So uh, the problem is not that wages are too high. The problem is that the overhead that labor has to pay in order to survive for rent, for medical care, for student loans, uh, for car loans, to have a car to drive to work, uh, for gas to drive to work, uh, to buy the monopoly uh, 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 prices uh, that you need in order to survive. All of these are too high. None of this even appears in economic textbooks that you need to uh, uh, get a good mark on in order to get an economics degree in order to be uh, suitably pliable to be hired by the Federal Reserve or the Council of Economic Advisors or by uh, corporations that use economists basically as public relations uh, spokesmen. So that, that's the mess we're in. Professor Hudson, in your article at your website, michael-hudson.com, you have an important section about the quantitative easing policies. We were talking about how there has been inflation in the past decade, but that inflation was largely in the fire sector, pushing up and in artificially inflating the prices of real estate and stocks. You note that while home ownership rates plunged for the, the U.S. population, the Federal Reserve's quantitative easing increased its subsidy of Wall Street's financial securities from $1 trillion to $8.2 trillion, of which the largest gain was in packaged home mortgages. This has kept housing prices from falling and becoming more affordable for home buyers. And you, of course, note that the Fed support of asset prices saved many insolvent banks, the largest ones, from going under. I have had you on to discuss in late 2019, before the COVID pandemic hit, we know that the Fed had this emergency bailout where it gave trillions of dollars in emergency repo loans to the biggest banks to prevent them from, from crashing, trying to save the economy. I do want to talk about this as well, because sometimes this is used by right-wingers who portray you know, Biden hilariously as a socialist. You were just talking about how the Democrats have a deeply neoliberal right-wing economic program. But of course, there is this rhetoric that we see from Republicans and conservatives claiming that Biden is a socialist. They claim that the reason there is inflation is because Biden is just printing money and giving money to people. Of course, that's, that's not at all what's happening. What, what has happened is that the Fed has printed trillions of dollars and given that to stockholders, to big corporations and to banks. And this is a point that I saw highlighted in that panel I mentioned, the Conference on Inflation that was organized by the International Manifesto Group. A colleague of yours, a brilliant political economist, Radhika Desai, mentioned, she said she invited everyone to go to the Fed website and look at the Fed balance sheet. And this is the Fed balance sheet from federalreserve.gov. This is the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System website. And it is pretty shocking to see this graph 
which show the total, it shows the total assets of the U.S. Federal Reserve. Back in 2008, it, the Federal Reserve had around 900 billion in assets. Now it's at nearly 9 trillion in assets. And we can see after the financial crash or during the financial crash, it increased to around 2 trillion. And then around 2014, it increased to around 4.5 trillion. And then especially in late 2019 and 2020, it skyrocketed from around four up to seven. And since then it has continued skyrocketing to $9 trillion in assets. Where did all of that money go? And what was the impact on the economy, of course? Well, uh, the impact uh, on the economy has been to vastly increase the wealth of the wealthiest 1% of Americans who own most of the stocks and bonds. Uh, Sheila Baer, the former head of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, pointed out that a, a, a lot of this uh, uh, $8 trillion has been to buy junk bonds. Here's the problem. Uh, uh, the problem really began uh, with President Obama. Uh, he inherited a system where uh, you had the largest wave of commercial bank fraud in American history as my colleague Bill Black at the University of Missouri at Kansas City has pointed out. Uh, everybody knew that there was a bank fraud on. The, uh, the newspapers referred to junk mortgages and uh, ninja borrowers, no income, no jobs, uh, no assets. Uh, so you had uh, mortgages, uh, banks had uh, written mortgages way above the actual va value of uh, homes, uh, especially to uh, racial and ethnic minorities. Uh, without any ability of the uh, borrowers to actually pay. And then these banks had uh, packaged these mortgages and sold them to hapless pension funds uh, and uh, other institutional investors and uh, to the European uh, banks that uh, have, are always very naive about uh, how honest American banks are. Uh, you had this whole accumulation of uh, what the 19th century called fictitious capital, mortgages uh, for property that wasn't worth anywhere near as much as the mortgage was for. So if the mortgage was defaulted, if uh, homeowners had jingle mail, in other words, you just mail, say, mail the keys back to the bank and say, okay, take the house. Uh, I'm going to, I find I can buy a house now at half the price uh, that uh, uh, Citibank or one of these other uh, banks uh, lend out. Uh, well, normally you'd have a crash of uh, prices back to realistic levels so that the value of mortgages actually reflected the value of property or the value of junk bonds reflected the ac uh, issued by a corporation reflected the actual earning power uh, of the corporation to pay interest on, on the junk bonds. So by the time uh, uh, Obama took over, the whole economy was largely a fictitious capital. Well, Obama came in and he said, my, my campaign donors are Wall on Wall Street. He called in the Wall Street bankers and he said, I'm the guy standing between you and the crowd with the pitchforks, the people who voted for me. But don't worry, I'm on your side. He said, all of them, I'm going to have the Federal Reserve create the largest amount of credit in human history. And it's all going to go to you. It's going to go to the 1% of the population. It's not going to go into the economy. It's not going to build infrastructure. It's not going into uh, wages. It's not going to reduce the price of homes and make them more affordable to Americans. It's going to push, it's going to keep the price of these junk bonds so high that they don't crash back to non-fictitious values. It's going to keep the stock market so high that it's not going to go down. It's going to create the largest bond market boom in history. The boom went from high interest rates to almost uh, low interest rates, meaning a, gi a gigantic rise in the price of bonds that actually pay interest. They're more than 0.1%. So there was a, a, a huge bond market boom, a huge stock market, uh, tripling of stock market prices. Uh, and uh, if you are a member of uh, the group that owns uh, 72% of American stocks, I think that's uh, the 10% of the population, you've got a much, much richer, but if you're a member of the 90% of the population, you've had to go further and further into debt just in order to survive.
just in order to pay for uh, medical care, student loans, uh, uh, and your uh, daily living expenses uh, out of your salary. Uh, so if American wages were uh, at a decent level, American families would not be pushed more and more into debt. The reason the debt has, the personal debt has gone up in the United States is because families can't get by on what they earn. So obviously, if they can't get by on what they earn and they have to borrow to get by, uh, they are not responsible uh, for causing uh, uh, the inflation. They're being squeezed. Uh, and the job of economists uh, and of uh, Democratic Party and Republican politicians is to distract attention from the fact that they're being squeezed and, and blame the victim and saying, you're doing it to yourself by uh, just wanting more money. You're actually creating the inflation that is uh, squeezing you. When actually it's the banks uh, and the government uh, non-enforcement of monopoly policy uh, and the government uh, uh, support of Wall Street that is responsible for uh, what's happening. Yeah, very, very well said. Professor Hudson, I should have uh, highlighted another part of this graph here. This is again, this is at the Federal Reserve Board website. It's it's even more revealing when you look at the, the selected assets of the Fed and you see that all of these assets basically are securities, securities held outright by the Fed. We see that Around 2008, the Fed had less than $500 billion in securities. And, you know, you have this policy of quantitative easing. And since then, I mean, basically all of the increase has been in securities of the roughly $9 trillion in assets the Fed holds. About, about $8.5 trillion is securities. I'm wondering if you can compare this to central banks in other countries. I mean, we've seen, for instance, that the Western sanctions on Russia were aimed at trying to destroy the Russian economy. President Biden claimed they were trying to make the ruble into rubble. In fact, the ruble is significantly stronger now than it was before the sanctions it's to such a degree that the Russian government and Russian National Bank are actually trying to decrease the value of the ruble because they think it's a little overvalued. It makes it a little harder to be competitive. So how, how does this policy of the U.S. Fed having $8.5 trillion worth of securities compared to the policies of other central banks. You have experience working with, with the Chinese government as an advisor. Do other governments, central banks have this policy? And, and that $8.5 trillion in securities, I mean, what are those securities? What, I mean, this, even, even from the perspective of these neoliberal economics textbooks that you were talking about, that people are taught in universities, this seems to me to be totally insane. I, I, I don't see how there is a even a an academic neoliberal textbook explanation for this policy. Very few people realize the difference between a central bank and a national treasury. The national treasury uh, is what used to perform all of the policies that central banks now do. The national treasury would be in charge of issuing money and spending it. Uh, Central banks were broken off in America in 1913 uh, from the, uh, 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 the, the Treasury in order to shift control of the money supply and credit away from Washington to New York. That was very explicit. The, uh, the original Federal Reserve didn't even permit a Treasury official to be on the board of directors. So the job of uh, a central bank is to represent the interest of the commercial banks. And as we've just pointed out, the interest of the commercial banks is to produce their product, debt. And uh, they create their product against existing assets, mainly real estate but also uh, uh, stocks and bonds. So the job of uh, the central bank here uh, is to increase uh, the, to support uh, the financial sector of the economy and uh, the, that sector that holds wealth in the form of stocks, bonds, and loans, and especially uh, bank bonds uh, that make their money off uh, real estate credit. Same thing in Europe, or Europe central bank. Uh, Europe has a, 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 is going into a, a real squeeze now and has been uh, going in a squeeze ever since you had uh, the Greek uh, a crisis. Uh, in Europe, uh, because uh, uh, right-wing monetarists designed the euro, uh, the euro, uh, part of the uh, 
uh, Eurozone rule is you cannot run a budget deficit, national budget deficit of more than 3% of uh, gross domestic product. Well, that's not very much. That means that you can't have a, po a, a real Keynesian policy in Europe to pull the economy out of depression. That means that if you're a country like Italy, right now, and uh, you have uh, a real uh, financial squeeze there, a corporate squeeze, a labor squeeze, uh, you're, the government cannot essentially rescue uh, either Italian industry or Italian labor. All it can, re uh, however, the uh, European Central Bank can, uh, by its uh, swap, uh, the way that it uh, creates credit by a central bank uh, uh, deposits, uh, the cent European Central Bank can vastly increase the price of European stocks, bonds, and packaged mortgages. So the European Central Bank is very much like the commercial bank. Uh, China is completely different because uh, China treats, uh, unlike uh, the West, China treats uh, money and credit as a public utility not as a private monopoly. And as a public utility, uh, the China's uh, central bank will say, uh, what are we going to want to create money for? Well, we're going to want to create money so that uh, uh, to build factories. We're going to want to create money so that uh, real estate uh, uh, developers can build uh, cities or sometimes overbuild cities. Uh, we, can, uh, we can create uh, money to actually spend in the economy for something tangible, for goods and services. Uh, the Chinese central bank does not create money to increase uh, stock market prices or bond prices. It doesn't uh, create money to support a financial class because it's uh, the Communist Party of China doesn't want a financial class to exist. It wants an industrial class to exist. It wants an industrial uh, labor force uh, to exist, but not a, uh, a rentier class. So uh, a central bank in a Western rentier economy basically uh, seeks to create credit to inflate the cost of living for home buyers and for anyone who uses credit uh, or needs credit, and to uh, enable uh, corporations to be financialized and to shift their management away from uh, making profits by investing in uh, plant and equipment and employing labor to produce more, to uh, making money by financial engineering. Uh, in the last uh, 15 years, over 90% of corporate uh, earnings in the United States had been spent not on uh, uh, stock buybacks and on dividend payouts. Only 8% of corporate earnings have been spent on new investment in plant and equipment and, and, and hiring. Uh, and so, of course, uh, you've had the economy deindustrialized. It's, the, uh, it's this idea that you can make money financially without an industrial base, without a manufacturing base, you can make money without actually producing more. You're doing anything productive simply by uh, having a central bank increase the, uh, the price of the stocks and bonds and the loans made by the wealthiest 10%. Uh, and of course, ultimately that doesn't work because at a certain point, the whole thing collapses from within uh, and there's no industrial base. And of course, uh, when that happens, America will find out, wait a minute, we're not, we, if we uh, close down the economy, uh, we're still reliant on, on China and Asia to produce our, our manufacturers and uh, to provide us with uh, raw materials and uh, to do everything uh, that we need. We're really not doing anything, but acting as a uh, world, uh, uh, well, people used to say parasite, uh, is a world uh, rentier, uh, is, a, uh, is getting some, something for nothing, is a kind of financial colonialism. So America, you could look at as a, a colonial power that uh, is a colonial power, not by military occupation, but simply by financial uh, 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 maneuvering uh, the, by the dollar standard. And uh, that's what's all being unwound uh, today uh, as a result of Biden's uh, 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 new Cold War. Professor Hudson, you criticize the strategy of simply trying to increase the interest rate to bring down inflation, noting that it's going to lead to a further decline in home ownership in the United States. It's going to hurt working people. I think that's a very valid criticism. Um, 
I'm curious, though, if you, what your take is on the response of the Russian central bank to the Western sanctions. We saw that the, the chair of the Russian central bank, Elvira Nabilina, she actually, I mean, this is someone who's not even necessarily really condemned a lot by Western economists. She's, she is pretty well respected by even, you know, Western neoliberal economists. And she did manage to deal with the with the uh, sanctions very well. She imposed capital controls immediately. She closed the Russian stock market. And also, in a controversial move, she raised the interest rates from around 9% up to 20% for a few months. And then what? after that, the Russian days. Central Bank dropped that those interest that rates. That was Sorry. very short. And now the, she's moved the interest rates way down. She Back was to 9%. criticized for not moving them further down. Yeah, well, go ahead. I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah, so sorry. So she raised immediately. She raised it to 20 percent and then has has declined the interest rate since then. I'm, I'm curious what you think about that policy. And yeah, go ahead. There's very little that a central banker can do when uh, the West has declared uh, a war, uh, a, a basically a war on a country to completely isolate it. Uh, the uh, the only response has come. Uh, from President Putin and from Foreign Secretary, uh, uh, the Foreign Secretary, uh, Lavrov. Lavrov. Yeah. And uh, they pointed out, well, how is Russia going to tr uh, going to trade and get what it, it needs? Uh, and this is what the recent meetings of the BRICS uh, are all about. Uh, and Russia realizes that uh, the world is now broken into two halves. America and the uh, NATO has separated the West. Basically, you have a white people's uh, confederation against all the rest of the world. Uh, and uh, the the West has said, we're, we're isolating ourselves from you totally, and uh, we think you can't get along without us. Well, look at the humor of this. Russia, China, Iran, India, Indonesia, uh, and other countries are saying, ha, you say, we, uh, we can't get along without you? Who is providing your manufacturers? Who is providing your raw materials? Who is providing your oil and gas? Who's providing your agriculture? Uh, your uh, and your, your the helium, uh, the titanium, uh, the nickel. Uh, so uh, they uh, they realize that okay, the world is breaking in two, and uh, Eurasia is uh, where most of the world's population is concentrated, is going to go its own way. The problem is, how do you really go your own way? You need a uh, means of, uh, a means of payment. You need to create uh, a whole international system uh, that is an alternative to the Western uh, international system. You need uh, your own uh, uh, international monetary fund uh, to uh, provide credit among uh, these for it so that the these Eurasian countries and their allies and now uh, the global south can deal with each other. You need a world bank that instead of lending money to promote U.S. Uh, 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 policies and U.S. investments uh, will promote uh, mutual gains and self-sufficiency among the countries. So already uh, uh, every uh, day in the last few weeks, uh, you've had meetings uh, with the Russians about this and said, okay, we're, we're going to uh, create a mutual trading area uh, starting among uh, the BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, uh, S South Africa, uh, and uh, China. And uh, we're going, how, do, how are we going to pay? We can't pay in dollars because if we have money in a dollar bank, uh, or a euro bank in Europe, they can just grab the money, uh, like they grab Venezuela's money. Uh, they can just say, "We're taking all your money because, uh, essentially, we we don't want you to exist as an alternative to the finance capital world that we are creating." So, uh, essentially, the, uh, the Russia, China, and the these other countries are saying, "Okay, we're going to create our own uh, in international uh, bank, and uh, how are we going to fund it?" Well, uh, we're going to fund it. Every uh, member of the bank will contribute, say, a uh, billion dollars or some some amount of their own currency, and uh, this will be our backing. Uh, we can also use gold uh, as a means of settlement, as as uh, was long used uh, uh, among countries. And this bank can create its own special drawing rights, uh, its own 
Bancor is what uh, Keynes called it. It can create its own uh, uh, credit. Well, the problem is that if you have uh, uh, Brazil, for instance, or Argentina uh, joining uh, this, this uh, group, uh, or Ecuador that uh, sells almost all of its bananas uh, to Russia, how is it going to get by? Well, uh, if, if uh, there is a, uh, a, a BRICS group or Shanghai Cooperation uh, organization bank. Obviously, uh, the Western uh, governments are not going to accept this. So Russia is going, uh, realizes that as a result of uh, Biden's uh, Cold War II, uh, there's going to be uh, a continued uh, rise in energy prices. You think gasoline prices are not high now? They're going up. You think food prices are not high now? They're going up more. Uh, and Europe is especially the case because Europe now uh, cannot uh, buy Russian gas to uh, make the fertilizer to make its, its uh, own crops grow. So uh, you're going to have uh, a number of countries uh, in uh, the global south from Latin America to Africa being squeezed and wanting to uh, trade with uh, the Eurasian group. Uh, and the problem is, uh, R Russia says, all right, we're going to be able, we know that you can't afford to pay. Uh, we, we're glad to give you credit, but we don't want to give you credit that you're going to simply uh, use the money you have to pay your dollar debts that are coming due. Because uh, one of the uh, effects that I didn't mention of the Federal Reserve raising interest rates is there's a, a huge flow of capital from uh, Europe and England into the United States so that uh, the uh, if you're a billionaire, where are you going to put your savings? You want the highest interest rates you want. And if the United States raises interest rates, it's going the billionaires are going to move their money out of uh, uh, England, out of the euro, and the euro is going, going down, down against the dollar. It's almost down to a dollar a euro. Uh, the British pound is heading downwards towards one pound uh, 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 Per, per dollar. So uh, all, this increase in the, the dollar's exchange rate is also rising against uh, the currencies of Brazil, Argentina, the African countries, all the other countries. So how are they going to pay this summer and this fall for their food, for their oil and gas, and for the higher cost of servicing their dollar debts? Well, uh, for Eurasia, they're going to say, we want to help you buy our export. We want to help you buy. Uh, Russia is now a major a grain exporter uh, and obviously also an uh, oil oil exporter, saying uh, we want to supply you and give you the credit for this, but uh, you're really going to have to make a decision. Are you going to join uh, the, the U.S. NATO bloc or are you going to join the Eurasian bloc? Are you going to join the White People's Club or the Eurasian club. Uh, and it really comes down to that. And that's what is fracturing the world into uh, these two halves. Uh, Europe is caught in the middle and its economies are going to be uh, 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 torn apart. Uh, uh, employment is going to go down there. Uh, and I don't see wages going up very much in Europe. Uh, you're going to have a political crisis in Europe, but also you'll have an international diplomatic crisis over how are you going to restructure uh, world trade and investment and uh, uh, and debt. There will be two different uh, financial philosophies. And that's what the new Cold War is all about. The, finan the philosophy of U.S.-sponsored finance capitalism, of making money financially without industrialization uh, and with uh, uh, um, uh, trying to lower wages and uh, reduce the labor force to a very highly indebted uh, workforce living on the margin, or you'll have uh, the Eurasian philosophy of using uh, the economic surplus to increase productivity, to build infrastructure, to create the kind of society that America seemed to be growing in the late 19th century, uh, but is now uh, rejected. So uh, all of this is uh, ultimately uh, not simply a problem of interest rates and central bank policy. It's really goes beyond central banks and to uh, what kind of a social and economic system are you going to have? And uh, the key to this, uh, any social or economic system is how you treat money and credit. 
Is money and credit going to be a public utility or will it be a private monopoly run for the financial interests and the 1% instead of a public utility run for the 99%? That's what the new Cold War is going to be all about. And that's what uh, international diplomacy week after week uh, is trying to settle. Yeah, very, very well said. And, and I, I really agree about this increasing kind of bipolar order where the U.S. led imperialist system is telling the world they have to pick a side. You know, as George W. Bush said, you're either with us or you're against us. You're with us. Or you're with the terrorists. That's what Biden is saying the world. And we see, you know, the West has drawn this iron curtain around Russia and now they're threatening to do the same around China. Now, of course, the difference is that China has the largest economy in the world, according to a PPP measurement. It's even larger than the U.S. economy. I don't know how they can try to sanction the Chinese economy, considering China is the central factory of the world. But this, this is related to a question I had for you, Professor Hudson. And this is from a super chat question from uh, Manoj uh, Bayardha. And uh, it's about how Chinese banks say they're not ready yet to develop an alternative to the SWIFT. Um, and he said he asked, how will the third world pay Russia for resources? And we've seen maybe you can talk about the measures being implemented. You know, India is, has this rupee ruble um, system that they've created. But I want to highlight an article that was published in Global Times. This is a major Chinese newspaper, and this is from April. And it, it quotes the former head of China's central bank who was speaking at a global finance forum in Beijing this April. And basically, he said that, you know, we need to prepare to rep replace SWIFT. He said the West's adoption of a financial nuclear option of using SWIFT to sanction Russia is a wake up call for China's financial development. And he said, quote, we must get prepared. So it, it seems that they're not yet prepared. But this is something that you've been talking about for years, or maybe you disagree. Maybe you think they already are prepared with the SWIFT alternative. Go well, ahead. we're using an alternative system. If they weren't using an alternative system, uh, Russia uh, is adopting part of the China's uh, system for this. Uh, they wouldn't be able to have uh, banks uh, communicate with each other. So, yes, they already have a rudimentary system. They're making it a, a, a better system uh, that can also be immune from uh, U.S. Uh, computer uh, espionage uh, uh, interference. So yes, of course, there's already a system. Uh, but I, I want to pick up on what you said about Biden, how Biden characterizes things. Biden characterizes the war of the West against Eurasia as between democracy and uh, autocracy. Uh, by democracy, he means uh, a free market run by Wall Street. He means an oligarchy. Uh, but what does he mean by autocracy? What he means by autocracy, when he called China an autocracy, an autocracy is a government strong enough to prevent an, uh, a, an oligarchy from taking power and taking control of the government for its own interests uh, and uh, uh, reducing the uh, rest of the economy to debt peonage. Uh, an autocracy is a country with public regulation against monopolies instead of uh, an oligarchic free market. Uh, an autocracy keep, uh, uses money and credit uh, essentially to help economies grow. And when debts cannot be paid uh, in China, uh, uh, if a factory uh, or a real estate company cannot pay debts, uh, China does not simply say, OK, uh, you're bankrupt. You're going to have to be sold. Uh, anybody can buy you. The Americans can buy you. Instead, the Chinese say, well, you can't pay the debts. We don't want to tear down your factory. We don't want your factory to be turned in gentrified into luxury housing, we're going to write down the debt. And that's what China has done again and again. Uh, and it's done that with foreign countries that couldn't pay the debt. Uh, when a, a debt that China has come due for China's development of a port or roads or infrastructure, uh, it says, well, we understand that you can't pay. We'll, uh, we, we'll delay payment. You know, we'll uh, have a moratorium on your payment. We're not here to bankrupt you. For the Americans, uh, through the international funds, 
they're saying, well, we are here to bankrupt you. And uh, now uh, if uh, we lend you, we, the IMF, lends you money uh, to avoid a currency devaluation, you'll have to, the term is, you're going to have to privatize your infrastructure. You're going to have to sell off your public utilities, your electric system, your roads, uh, your land uh, to private buyers, mainly from the United States. So you have, uh, an, uh, you have a democracy supporting uh, bankruptcy, foreclosure, financialization, and privatization, and low wages by a permanent depression, a permanent depression to keep down wages, or you have autocracy seeking to protect the interests of uh, labor by uh, supporting a living wage to increase living standards is a precondition for increasing productivity, uh, for building up infrastructure. Uh, you, you have these two diametrical economic systems. And again, that's why uh, there's a Cold War on right now. Uh -huh. And and there's another uh, super chat question here, Professor Hudson. You mentioned the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. We've talked about that many times. This is from Sam Owen. He asked, why do countries continue to accept bad IMF loans when they have such a poor track record? Is it just the U.S. government meddling in the national politics or there are cases of good IMF loans? <laughs> well, what is a country? Uh, when you say a country to most people, People think, okay, let's talk about Brazil. Let's talk about all the people in Brazil. You think of, uh, you have a picture in the mind of the Amazon. You have a big city with a lot of people in it. But uh, the country in terms of uh, the IMF is uh, a group of maybe uh, 15 wealthiest families in Brazil uh, that own most of the money. And uh, they are quite happy to borrow from the IMF because they say, right now, there's a chance that Lula may become president instead of uh, the neo-fascist Bolsonaro. Uh, and if Lula comes in, then uh, he's going to support labor policies, not uh, uh, and he may stop us from tearing down the Amazon. Uh, so uh, let's move our money out of the country. Well, normally this would push the exchange rate of the Cruzeiro down. So the IMF is going to make a loan to Brazil to support the Cruzeiro so that the, uh, the wealthy 1% of Brazil can move their money into dollars, into euros, into uh, foreign currency, into offshore banking centers, and uh, load uh, Brazil down with debt so that then when there's an election, and if Lula is uh, uh, elected, the IMF is going to say, well, right now, uh, 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 we're not going to, uh, we don't really like your policies. And if you uh, pursue a pro-labor socialist policy, then uh, uh, there's going to be a capital flight. And uh, uh, we're insisting that you pay all the money that you borrowed from the West right back now. Well, that's going to lead Lula, uh, Lula either to uh, uh, sit there, follow the IMF direction, and let the IMF run the economy instead of his own government, uh, or to say, we're not going to pay the foreign debt. Well, until now, no country's been in a strong enough position not to pay uh, the foreign debt. But for the first time, now that you have the Eurasian group, uh, the, uh, we'll call it BRICS, but it's really Eurasia, uh, uh, and along with the southern uh, 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 gr groups that are joining us, the Global South, uh, for the first time, they can say, we're going to, uh, we can't afford to stay in the West anymore. We cannot afford to submit the economy to the IMF demands for privatization. We cannot submit to the IMF rules that we have to uh, fight against labor, that we have to pass laws banning labor unions, that we have to fight against the labor's wages like uh, uh, Western democracies uh, insist on. We have to go with the Chinese autocracy, which we call socialism. Uh, and of course, when America accuses China of being an autocracy, autocracy is the American word for socialism. Uh, they don't want to use that word. So we're <laughs> back in Orwellian uh, double things. So the question is, what will the global South countries uh, do uh, when uh, they, uh, they uh, cannot afford to buy energy and uh, food this summer and uh, without an IMF loan? Are they going to really say, okay, uh, we're, we can only survive by, by joining the break from the West and joining the Eurasian group. That's what uh, uh, the big uh, world uh, fracture uh, is all about. And I described this global fracture already in 1978, and uh, uh, where I, I, I wrote a book, Global Fracture. 
explaining just exactly how all of this was going to happen. And at that time, you had uh, Indonesia, uh, you had uh, Sukarno uh, taking the lead. The non-aligned nations, India, Indonesian, uh, were trying to create an alternative to the financialized uh, American-centered world order. But none of these countries had uh, a critical mass sufficient to go their own way. Well, now for the now for the first now that America has uh, isolated Russia, China, India, Iran, Turkey, uh, uh, all these countries, now there's uh, it's created a critical mass that is able to go its own way. And the question is, now you have it's like a gravitational pull. Will this Eurasian mass attract Latin America and Africa uh, to its own uh, uh, group uh, away from the United States? And where is that going to leave the United States and Europe? Yeah, and we saw one of the clearest examples yet of this bipolar division of the world between, you know, the West and the rest, as they say, with this ridiculous meeting that was just held of the G7. Of course, the G7 are, you know, the white Western countries, and then they'll throw in, you know, U.S. occupied Japan in there to pretend like they're a little more diverse. But we saw that the G7 just held a summit and basically the entire summit was about how can we contain china how can we expand the new cold war on russia into a new cold war on china and here's a report in bbc g7 summit leaders detail 600 billion dollar plan to rival china's belt and road initiative now i got a chuckle out of this the idea that the u.s government is going to build infrastructure in the global south i mean it's pretty laughable it's also Absurd considering that China's Belt and Road Initiative, which involves over half of the countries on Earth, is estimated at many trillions of dollars in infrastructure projects. So the U.S. and its allies think that they can challenge that with 600 billion in public-private partnerships. I should stress, of course, what they announced is going to be a mixture of so-called public initiative and then contracts for private corporations. So it's yet another g giveaway to the private sector in the name of building infrastructure. But I'm wondering if if you can comment on the G7 summit that just was held. Well, nothing really came out of it. They all uh, said that they could not agree on any more sanctions uh, against Russia uh, because they're already uh, hurting uh, enough. Uh, India in particular uh, stood up and said, look, uh, uh, there's no way that we're going to uh, uh, join uh, the sanctions against Russia because uh, it's uh, one of our major trading partners. And by the way, we're getting uh, a huge benefit from importing uh, Russian oil, and you're getting a huge benefit by getting this oil from us uh, at a markup. So uh, the G7 could not get any agreement on uh, what to do. It's, it is, it's already at a stalemate. Uh, and this is only June. Imagine the stalemate it's going to be uh, in... Uh, <laughs> in September. Well, uh, next week, I think uh, President Biden is going to Saudi Arabia and saying, uh, you know, we're willing to kill maybe uh, 10 million more Yemeni, uh, uh, more of your enemies. We're, we're willing to help uh, your Wahhabi uh, Sunni uh, groups uh, kill uh, more of the uh, Iranian Shiites and uh, uh, sabotage uh, uh, Iraqi uh, and uh, a Syrian, we'll, we'll fight you and uh, back Al-Qaeda again uh, if you will lower your oil prices so that we can squeeze uh, Russia more. So uh, that's uh, really the question that uh, uh, Saudi Arabia will have. Uh, America will send it, give it more uh, cluster bombs to use against Yemen. Uh, and the question is, is Saudi Arabia going to say, okay, we're going to uh, earn maybe uh, 10 billion less dollars a month uh, or however much uh, they're making uh, just to uh, make you happy and so that uh, uh, you will uh, kill uh, more uh, Shiites uh, who uh, support uh, Iran? Or are they going to realize that if they throw their, in their uh, lot with uh, the United States, all of a sudden uh, they'll be under attack from Iran, uh, Russia, Syria, uh, and it'll be a, uh, uh, <laughs> they'll be sitting ducks. Uh, so what are they going to do? Uh, can, I don't see any way that Biden can actually uh, succeed in getting Saudi Arabia to uh, voluntarily uh, uh, earn less on its oil prices. Maybe Biden can say it's only for a year or two, only for one or two years. 
Uh, but as uh, other countries know, when America says only for a year or two, it really means forever. Uh, and if you don't uh, uh, continue, then somehow they have a regime replacement or a regime change uh, and a color revolution. So uh, uh, Biden is going to is, keeps trying to get foreign countries to join the West against Eurasia. But uh, there's Saudi Arabia sitting right in the middle of it. Uh, and uh, all that Europe can do is watch and uh, wonder how, uh, how it's going to get by without, uh, uh, without energy and uh, uh, without much food. Yeah, in fact, Venezuela's President Maduro just confirmed that the Biden administration has sent another delegation basically begging Venezuela to try to work out some deal because, of course, the U.S. and the EU have boycotts of Russian energy. So it, it, it's really funny to me that after years of demonizing Venezuela, portraying it as a dictatorship and all of this, the U.S. had to decide, well, the war in Venezuela is not as important as the war in Russia right now. So we're going to temporarily pause our war in Venezuela to, to, you know, stick the knife in deeper into Russia. But on the, on the subject of the, the G7 meeting, this, this was the hilarious comment made by the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. This is an article in Reuters titled, Europe must give developing nations alternative to Chinese funds. So echoing, you know, the same perspective that we hear from Biden, U.S. government officials constantly say that, you know, the U.S. needs to challenge China and the global south. So Europe pledged 300 billion euros. However, once again, important asterisk, in private and public funds over five years to fund infrastructure in developing countries. So once again, we see another neoliberal private par public partnership. It's going to be another public, uh, you know, giveaway to private corporations. And of course, she said that this is part of the G7's drive to counter China's multi-trillion dollar Belt and Road project. Now, in the article that this is really just tying everything together that we've been talking about today, Professor Hudson, in your article on the Fed's austerity program to reduce wages, you conclude the article noting that the depression that, the, that people in the United States are on the verge of facing because of these, poli these neoliberal policies telling workers in the U.S. that they need to decrease their wages and be unemployed in order to stop inflation. You point out that Biden's military and State Department officers warn that the fight against Russia is just the first step in their war against China's non-neoliberal economy and may last 20 years. That is a long depression. But as Madeleine Albright would say, they think that the price is worth it. And you talk about the new Cold War against you know, the socialist economy in China and the state-led um, state economy in Russia. So you, you predict not only a depression is coming, We've seen that in mainstream media outlets. Larry Summers said, you know, a depression could be coming for a few years. But you, you say, no, not only is a depression coming, it's going to be a long depression. We could be seeing 20 years. And basically, the U.S. government and other Western leaders, as we see Ursula von der Leyen from the EU, they're basically telling their populations, tighten your belts. We have decades of depression coming because we have collectively decided as Western leadership, that we are going to force the world through a long depression economically, or at least force the West through a long economic depression in order to try to halt the rise of China and Russia. They're basically telling their populations, suck it up, tighten your belts for decades, because in the end, the price is worth it in order to prevent the collapse of our empires. That's right. Uh, when uh, they're talking about a private uh, uh, public initiative. They're talking about Pentagon capitalism. That means the government will give trillions of dollars to private firms and ask them to build infrastructure that, uh, they, that if they build a port or a road in a, a global south country, uh, they will uh, operate this at a profit. And it will be enormously expensive infrastructure uh, because the expense uh, to make uh, financial money off this infrastructure, you have to uh, uh, 
price it at the cost of production, which is Pentagon capitalism type uh, inflated prices. Uh, you have to pay management fees, you have to pay profits, you have to pay interest rates, uh, as opposed to uh, the Chinese uh, way of funding is equity. Uh, the Western mode of funding is all debt leveraged. China uh, back takes as collateral for the infrastructure that it ba bases uh, an equity ownership uh, in the port or the other, uh, uh, the whatever infrastructure, the belt and road uh, that it's, it's building. So you have the difference between equity ownership, debt-free ownership, uh, where uh, if it makes, uh, if it can afford to pay, fine. If it doesn't make an income, there are no dividends to pay. Or you have the the debt uh, leverage that is that is intended that the government cannot pay it, so that uh, the government that will be the co-signer for the debt for all of this infrastructure will somehow uh, uh, be obliged to tax its whole population to pay the enormous super profits, the enormous monopoly rents, the enormous debt charges uh, the, of uh, the Leyden's uh, Margaret Thatcher plan. Leyden thinks that uh, she's another, she can do to Europe and to America what Margaret Thatcher did to England. And uh, if she does, then, uh, 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 then America and Europe deserve it. Yeah, and Professor Hudson, as we start wrapping up here, um, I know you, you you have to go pretty soon. Uh, just a, a few short questions here at the end. I'm wondering if what we're also seeing is is not only this fundamental crisis in the Western neoliberal financialized economies, but it's also this bubble that has burst, or at least it, this phase that is over, in which, at least this is my reading, I'm curious if you agree, that in the 1990s, the peak of you know, the so-called golden age of neoliberalism. We had Bill Clinton and riding this wave, and it was the end of history, Francis Fukuyama's nonsense prediction, all that. How much of that was not only based on, you know, this exorbitant privilege, as the French call it, of the dictatorship of the U.S. dollar. We talked about that in, in based on your book, Super Imperialism, how the U.S. was given this massive global free lunch economically because of dollar hegemony. But how much of it was not just that, but also the fact that in the 1990s and the first decade of the 2000s, the U.S. and Western Europe had access to very cheap consumer goods from Asia and very cheap energy from Russia. That, to me, it seems like those two factors are some of the most important reasons why there, this golden age of neoliberalism in the 90s and early 2000s was even possible. It was on the back of low-paid Asian workers, and based on this idea that Russia would permanently be what what Obama called it, a gas station. Well, we've seen that one, that East Asian economies have lifted themselves up out of poverty, especially China has ended extreme poverty, raised median wages significantly. And now, of course, the West has sanctioned itself against buying Russian energy, massively increasing the cost of energy around the world. So do you think that 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 bubble or that, that brief moment of, you know, the end of history, golden age of neoliberalism, that that can never come back because unless they unless the West can succeed in overthrowing the Russian government and imposing a new puppet like Yeltsin and overthrowing the Chinese government, it seems like that that that, you know, that the golden age in the 1990s is never going to come back. Well, you've left out the key element of the golden age. That is military force and uh, the willingness to assassinate uh, any uh, foreign leader that uh, does not want to go along with U.S. policy. You're for, uh, you're neglecting what America did to Pinochet. You're neglecting how America to, to uh, Allende, to took Allende. over uh, uh, Brazil. Uh, uh, America's meddling uh, and control. Uh, and in Europe, the wholesale bribery and manipulation of Europe's political system to uh, put in charge of the Green Party uh, a, a pro-war leadership anti, uh, and an anti-environmental leadership, to put in charge of every socialist party of Europe, right-wingers, uh, neoliberals, uh, every European socialist and labor party is turned neoliberal largely by American uh, maneuvering and uh, meddling is the uh, uh, American word uh, in their foreign policy. So uh, it's that uh, meddling that was uh, intended to prevent 
any alternative economic philosophy from existing uh, uh, is a to rival neoliberalism. So that when uh, you talk about the end of history, what is the end of history? It means the end of change. It means stop. There will be no reform. There will be no change in the neoliberal system that we have locked in. The, uh, and of course, the only way that you can really end history is uh, by what Biden is, thre is threatening, atomic war to blow up the world. That is the neoliberal end of history, and it's the only way that the neoliberals can really stop history. Uh, apart from that, all they can try to do is to prevent any change that is adverse to uh, locking in the neoliberal order. So the end of history is a declaration of war against any country that wants to go its own way, any country that wants uh, to build up its own economy uh, as uh, a way that will uh, keep the benefits of its economic growth in its own country instead of letting it go to the uh, uh, global financial class centered in the United States uh, and Britain. So uh, we're talking about the uh, neoliberalism was always a belligerent, implicitly military policy, and that's exactly what you're seeing in the proxy war of U.S., NATO, and Ukraine today. Yeah, very well said. I, that's the other key ingredient, overthrowing any government that is a challenge that shows there is an alternative to try to prove the, you know, the, the maxim that there is no alternative. Yes. Here's an interesting comment from Christopher Dobby. He points out that in Australia, the average age for their first homeowner was 27 in 2001. Now it's 35 and increasing more and more by the year. Now, in the last few minutes here, Professor Hudson, here's another brief question that I got um, from, a, um, from someone over at patreon.com slash multipolarista. People can go and support this show. One of my patrons asked this question, um, who, who is hurt most by the Fed or other central banks raising interest rates, people, average consumers, or companies? And obviously, I mean, you talked earlier about how the, the, the U.S. Federal Reserve is different from other central banks, but... It's kind of an open question. Who is hurt more by raising interest rates? Well, companies are certainly hurt because uh, uh, it means that uh, any possibility of uh, uh, getting uh, productive credit uh, uh, is raised, but they're also benefited because if interest rates raise, uh, go up high enough, then it will not pay corporate raiders to borrow money to take over and raid companies and empty them out. Uh, like uh, uh, they, they did in the 1980s. So uh, everything cuts both, both, both ways. Uh, the raising the interest rates have given commercial banks a, an excuse to raise the interest charges on uh, credit card loans, on mortgage debts. So raising interest rates to the banks uh, still have enabled them to actually increase their uh, mar margin uh, of uh, uh, monopoly profits on uh, the credit that they uh, extend. And that certainly uh, hurts people who are reliant on bank credit, uh, either for mortgages or uh, for uh, consumer debt uh, or for uh, uh, any kind of loans uh, that they want to take out. Uh, basically, rising interest rates hurts debtors, benefits creditors. So, And uh, benefiting creditors very rarely helps the economy at large because the creditors are always really the 1%. Uh, the debtors are the 99%. And if you think of economies, when you say, how does an economy benefit? You realize that, well, if the economy is 1% creditors and 99% debtors, uh, uh, you, it's a, you're dealing with a bifurcation there. Uh, and you have to realize that bifurcation that uh, uh, the creditors usually occupy the government and they claim we are the country uh, and the 99% are uh, not very visible. Uh, democracy can only be afforded if uh, the population's voting has no effect at all on the government, that it's only symbolic. Mm -hmm. You can vote exactly which oligarch uh, you want to rule your country. Uh, ever since Rome, that was uh, the case, and it's the case today. Is there really any difference between the Republicans and Democrats uh, in terms of their policy when you have uh, the same central bank bureaucracy, the same State Department uh, uh, blob, uh, the same military industrial complex, uh, the same Wall Street uh, control? Uh, d uh, what does democracy mean in a situation like that? Uh, the only way that you can have uh, what democracy aims at is to have 
uh, a government strong enough to check the financial interest, to check the 1%, acting on behalf of the 99%. Uh, and that's what socialism means. Very well said. Here's another brief question from a patron over at patreon.com slash multipolarista. People can become a patron and help support the show over there. Um, this question, Professor Hudson, is about the, a, the proposal of an excess profits tax as an alternative to try to contain inflation. What do you think about the proposal of an excess profits tax? Well, only the little people make profits. Uh, if you're a billionaire, you don't want to make a profit. You want to uh, uh, essentially uh, take all of your uh, return in the form of capital gains. That's where your money is. Uh, and you, the way you avoid making a profit is you establish uh, an offshore uh, uh, bank or creditor, and you pay out all of your profits in the form of interest, which are an expense. Uh, you, know, you expense all of uh, what used to be what really is income, uh, and you show no profits at all. Uh, uh, micro, I don't think uh, uh, Amazon has uh, uh, ever made a profit. Uh, you have huge, huge, the biggest uh, corporations with all the capital gains have no profit. Tesla is uh, uh, a gigantic uh, uh, stock market uh, presence, uh, uh, and uh, it doesn't make a profit. So uh, the key is capital gains, is financial gains, stock market gains, gains in uh, real estate prices, uh, unearned income. Free, that's what the free lunch is. Uh, uh, you, you want to uh, prevent profits being paid out in the form of interest. So uh, you want, I would vastly increase profits by uh, saying you cannot deduct uh, interest as a business expense. It's not a business expense. It's a, a predatory uh, parasitic expense. So you're going to have to declare all of this as profit and pay interest on it. Uh, 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 pricing your uh, oil or your uh, output uh, from a foreign offshore banking uh, center so that you don't seem to make any profit like uh, uh, Apple does, uh, pretending to make all its money in Ireland, uh, uh, you can't do that anymore. You're going to have to pay uh, a real uh, return. So uh, the, wor the uh, accounting profession has uh, made profits essentially tax-free. So the pretense of making money by taxing profits uh, uh, avoids talking about capital gains and all of the uh, fictitious uh, 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 fictitiously low profits that are simply pretended not to be profit, like interest, uh, depreciation, amortization, offshore uh, earnings, management fees. All of these uh, should be counted as profits and taxed as such as they were, uh, I'd say, back at uh, Eisenhower administration level. And finally, uh, the, the last question here, Professor Hudson, someone asked about uh, the U.S. government is pressuring countries in Africa not to buy Russian wheat. And the U.S. is, of course, claiming that this wheat is supposedly stolen from Ukraine. But, I mean, this article, this headline at Newsweek, it summarizes it pretty well. U.S. warns starving African nations to not buy grain stolen by Russia. Again, that stolen is alleged by the U.S. But you actually have a really good column about this over at your website, at, which, again, is Mike, michael-hudson.com. Is the U.S. and NATO, with help from the World Economic Forum, pushing for a global South famine? I know, uh, you know, this is a long, this could be a long point of discussion. It could be the entire interview, but I know you have to go soon. But just concluding here, I'm wondering if you could comment on the, the United Nations itself has warned that there could be a famine, especially in global South nations, and what you think it, the role of these neoliberal policies and Western sanctions are in fueling that potential crisis? Well, the wealthiest uh, families in the world go, uh, uh, used to go every year, now they go every few years, to, uh, the, uh, to Davos, uh, to uh, Klaus Schwab's uh, uh, Davos, uh, World Economic Forum. And they say, the world's overpopulated. We need uh, about 2 billion uh, human beings to starve, preferably in the next year or two. So it's as if the wealthy families have got together and say, how can we thin out the population that uh, really we, the 1%, don't need? Uh, and it's, it, it's all of their policies. It is as if they've decided to follow the World Economic Forum and uh, deliberately shrink the world population, uh, especially in Africa, 
and Latin America. Uh, remember, these are white people at the World Economic Forum. Uh, and uh, that is uh, their idea of how to retain equilibrium. They're always talking about equilibrium. And equilibrium uh, is going to be for countries that cannot afford to uh, uh, grow their own uh, food because they've uh, put their money into plantation crops and cotton to sell to, uh, uh, to the West instead of uh, uh, feeding themselves, uh, that uh, they're just going to have to starve to contribute to world equilibrium. Yeah, and just uh, while we're on the subject of the World Economic Forum, I guess uh, um, I should just really briefly add, what, we've talked about this a little bit, but I just feel remiss, remiss not mentioning it. It's interesting to see how right-wingers have seized on the World Economic Forum and begun criticizing it a lot. Obviously, it's worth criticizing. It's a horrible neoliberal institution that represents, you know, the Western capitalist class. But we've even seen, you know, Glenn Beck, the right-winger former Fox News host, he published a book about the Great Reset and the World Economic Forum. I, I'm just wondering really quickly if you could respond to the idea that the World Economic Forum is like some socialist uh, organization. Obviously, it's the exact opposite. But what, what do you say to, to these conservatives who have a right wing critique of the World Economic Forum and think it's like secretly socialist and Biden is a socialist? They look at any... Uh a government or managerial power is socialist, not drawing the distinction between socialism and oligarchy. Uh, the question is, uh, government power can be either right wing or left wing. Uh, and to say that any government power is socialist is just uh, uh, degrading, uh, degrading the word. Uh, it's <laughs> However, uh, as I mentioned before, almost all of the European uh, socialist parties are neoliberal. Uh, Tony Blair was the head of something that called itself the British Labour Party. Gordon Brown was the head of the British Labour Party. You can't be uh, more uh, neoliberal uh, and oligarchic than that. And that's why Margaret Thatcher said her greatest uh, success was creating Tony Blair. Uh, you have the same thing in France, the French uh, socialists, ultra right wing of the spe spectrum. Uh, this, uh, the uh, Greek Socialist Party, right wing uh, of the spectrum. You have socialist parties throughout the world being uh, neoliberalized. So what does the word socialism mean? You want to go beyond labels uh, into the essence. And uh, the, the question is, in whose interest is the government going to be run for? Will it be run for the 1% or the 99%? Uh, and the right wing wants to say, well, the 1% can be socialist because they're taking over the government and that's a big government. We're against it. Well, the right wing is taking over the government, but it's not uh, really uh, uh, what the world meant by socialism a century ago. Yeah, very well said. I just I always laugh when I see these right wing critiques of the World Economic Forum. I mean, the World Economic Forum is the embodiment of capitalism. It is the you know, group of the elite capitalists who get together to talk about how they can exploit the working class and help monopolize the global economy on behalf of Western capital. So with that said, I mean, there's there's still many questions, but I know you have to go and we're already at an hour and a half. So I do want to thank everyone who joined. We're at 1200 viewers right now. So it's been a really good response. Uh, Professor Hudson, you're very popular. You should do your own YouTube channel. Maybe we can talk about that or something because every time I have you on, it's always an amazing response that I get. And hopefully we can do this again more in the future. Um, aside from people going to your website, michael-hudson.com, is there anything else that you want to plug before we conclude? Well, the book that I just wrote, The Destiny of Civilization, is all about what, uh, uh, what we've been talking about. It's about uh, the world split uh, between uh, neoliberalism and uh, socialism. So uh, uh, that's just published and is available on Amazon. And I have uh, two more books that are coming out very shortly. Yeah, for people who are interested, I did an interview with Professor Hudson here at Multipolarista a few weeks ago about his new book, The Destiny of Civilization, Finance Capitalism, Industrial Capitalism, or Socialism. If you're watching on YouTube, Check out my channel here. You can find the interview I did with him. And, and also, if you're on YouTube, please click the subscribe button below. And of course, anyone who wants to support this show, you can go to patreon.com slash multipolarista. 
And as always, this will be available as a podcast. So if you want to listen to the interview again, I'm certainly going to listen to this discussion again. You can find that anywhere there are, there are podcasts. And also, as always, when I'm done with this interview, I'm going to publish a transcript of our interview. Professor Hudson has transcripts of all of his interviews available at his website. Professor Hudson, it's always a real pleasure. Thanks so much for joining me. Well, I enjoyed the discussion. And like I said earlier at the beginning, for me, I truly think it's always a, a privilege because I do think you're one of the greatest living economists. So I, I always feel very privileged to have the opportunity to pick your brain about all of these questions. And I want to thank everyone who commented, who watched, and who listened. I will see you all next time.